Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. And welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. Today, we've got a real treat for you. What we're going to be talking about is front wheel drive dynamics and tuning this using simulation. Let's get started. Like it or like it or not, front wheel drive is now part of the motorsport landscape. Now, the thing you've got to understand about front wheel drive is it is a very, very different animal to its rear wheel drive um, counterpart. And what we're going to be talking about today is the dynamics of front wheel drive, and in particular, how they present their own unique set of challenges. And then I'm going to give you a bit of a game plan about how to tune this using simulation. So let's get started. When we take the free body diagram of a front wheel drive car, the biggest difference is that there are no tractive forces at the rear. They're all at the front. They're all being applied on the slip angle line. So yes, there's a little bit of benefit to be had from that because, uh, because of um, uh, thrust vectoring um, effects. And they do sort of pay off um, uh, for, uh, for road cars. However, let's take a uh, uh, before we uh, uh, go into further detail about this for a racing application, let's have a look at some typical front wheel drive numbers. The weight is in the order of 12 to 1400 kilos. The CG height is typically between half to 0.6 per meter. And the front weight distribution is between 60 to 70 percent. The other thing to remember for a front wheel drive is if we take a look at your typical touring car racing tire, if you take a look at this plot, if you're getting to a load of about 650 kilograms force, you're pretty much getting towards a law of diminishing returns. The tire isn't saturated at this point, but it's getting pretty close. So bear that in mind. So given all that, the challenge that we are dealing with with front wheel drive is if we take a look for a typical front wheel drive car for a 1G turn, at, and it weighs about 1320 kilos, and we crunch through what the numbers look like with a 50-50 weight distribution, we're gonna come up with something that looks like this. The rear tire loads, uh, the outside is 488.3 kilograms force. Um, the inside rear is 48.3 kilograms force. The outside um, front um, tire load is 611.8 kilograms force. And the inside is at 171.7 kilograms force. So once you start punching through some serious numbers here, the challenge you're going to be facing with front wheel drive is it's the worst of all worlds coming together because we're loading that outside front tire and getting it pretty close to its saturation point. But when we hit uh, the accelerator to try and get out of um, the uh, 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 try and get out of the corner, we're going to be presented with um, uh, we're going to be presented with a tricky set of circumstances. Now, the thing about it is we can work around that to an extent. But the thing you've really got to understand about front wheel drive setup, particularly once you start heading, uh, once you start heading a cornering group of about a G or north of a G, you really are, it really is disaster management. Another thing to consider is if we take a look at a typical overlay between a front wheel drive, between a simulation for a front wheel drive, uh, for a front wheel drive car. Now, this is probably not the best of comparisons because this was one of these race weekends where it was all turning to hell in a waste paper basket. But this is the other thing that you're dealing with a front wheel drive. If we take a look at take a look at that throttle, take a look at just how long it takes you to get to both full throttle, both with actual, which is colored, and simulated, which is black. The other thing too is this particular car was running a CLA or a downforce coefficient times area north of about four. So this really illustrates the challenge that you're dealing with with front wheel drive, really illustrating what happens when you get these two, uh, when you get these two things that are coming together. It's not ideal, but there are ways you can mitigate, uh, where you can mitigate the damage. Now, in terms of what you should be looking at in terms of order of magnitude of effects, if we take a look at um, say, uh, say some typical order of magnitude of effects, say for example, a degree worth of steer at a slip angle of about say three degrees and at 700 kilos force, you've got a turning moment of about 1330 Newton meters. The max diff potential, presuming we're driving all of that load 
through um, the outside front tyre alone, you've got a turning moment of about 315 um, newton metres. And your toe adjustment, which actually took me by surprise, for a mil toe adjustment over a rolling tyre radius of about 300 mil, gives you a, um, an adjustment of about 250, um, um, newton, uh, uh, 250 newton metres. Now, just to sort of give you an idea of the calibre of these numbers, we were doing a weight of about 1,320 kilos, a CG height of about half a metre, a front weight distribution of 60%, and a wheelbase of about two and a half um, metres. Now, so given all that, this is our order of business when we're tuning a front wheel drive car. If it's legal, aerodynamics, I'm not gonna go into that because quite frankly, that's like telling you to suck eggs. Then we're looking at things like suspension geometries, bar, springs, diff and dampers, and then our final finishing touch is toes. Albeit, that toe is probably gonna play a bit more of a role um, uh, than um, what you would first think, because going into this analysis, I really thought that I was gonna be saying to all of you that toe is the cherry on top. But there's, you know, there's a bit of um, cheddar to be had here. Probably not as much as what you'll be doing with geometry, bar, springs and diffs, but there's, um, there's something to be had, and particularly for what you're going to be doing with front-wheel drive, to try and ignore that would just be silly. Now, before simulating, one of the things I'd really encourage you to do is use a static Excel force balance sheet. Now, what this does is this is um, a typical internal one that I use. Now, look, it's not going to get any prizes, uh, any beauty awards for an Excel spreadsheet, but it's, fun uh, uh, but it's functional. So in there, you put in your front and your rear roll centers, your weight distributions, your CG heights, your tire spring rates, your, your spring rates and your bar rates and your motion ratios, you put in your corner, the corner curvature and you put in your tire model and it'll give you some predicted cornering speeds. Now, the beauty about something like this is it just gives you a feel of the numbers and knowing what to expect. And also too, when you're using a tool such as the Chassis Tire Force Modeling Toolbox, it gives you a great feedback loop when you combine that um, with tire data. So that's something really, uh, that's um, uh, something um, uh, to bear in mind. So what we did, was I took um, a typical front wheel drive car. I actually based it on the chassis sim WRX um, MY98 template and I just converted that into a front wheel drive car. And I just threw some mud on the wall and here was, um, uh, and here was some uh, results. So the open, I started with an open diff baseline and I used this um, for the Willow Vegas circuit in Queensland. Now, I do that not because I want to take a summer holiday there. It's just the, the, the thing about Willow Bank, it's got a bit of everything like high speed and low speed. So it's a good little thing to throw some uh, mud, on the wall, uh, mud on the wall with. So the open diff baseline was about a, a 93.76 seconds. Then I moved to an LSD at the front with a locking ratio of 10%, and that was a gain of about, two, uh, about 0.16 of a second. So that dropped to 83.6 seconds. Um, the super diff, um, what that does is it gives you the perfect distribution of um, your front and rear uh, of um, your uh, of what's going on between your uh, fr uh, of what happens between your front force and your rear force when they're distributed on the traction circle radius, and that was a really big gain of eighty two point four seconds. Then I played around with the bar. I went from the baseline of about a sixty one point one newton per millimeter rear bar, increased that to a hundred, and um, did and that was a further gain at eighty three point five seconds. And I um uh, and I changed the rear roll center from a um, rear roll center of minus twenty eight mil to minus three mil, and that was a gain again. And for those cha for those chassis changes, the baseline was the LSD at um ten uh, percent. Now let me walk you through how you actually go about implementing that in chassis sim because it's actually incredibly simple. So to implement a limited slip diff, you select diff option four for your LSD. Then you go to your front diff options and you go to your access property calculator and here you can put in the locking ratio you want. I put in a bit of a diff for a free play. This is just to give Chassis Sim some numerical wiggle room. I click that on OK and that's how you go through and put a limited slip diff. For your super diff, you put in on, um, uh, uh, you uh, put in a diff of um, two. For your bars, all you gotta do is click on the rear bar and uh, to change that from the baseline of 61.119 newtons per, me uh, per millimetre to 100 newtons per millimetre, it's just a matter of doing that. And for adjusting your rear suspension geometry, all you've got to do, uh, all you've got to do the baseline is the lower control arm points 
at 195 for a McPherson strut. You go analyze that configuration, then what you can do is raise those lower rear control arm points, like these points here, points one and two, to 205 mil. You click on analyze configuration, then apply that, and um, you're good to go. Now, what was really interesting was um, having a closer look at those results. So if we take a look at the open diff baseline and take a look at what the LSE did. Take a look at what it did in one of the low, in the lower speed corners. Okay, going in, there was a little bit of a loss, but you know nothing terribly uh, major to sing home about. But once we got onto power, take a look at that difference in cheddar in terms of your power out. 86.45 plays about 86.28. But if we take a look at once we're actually getting into the corner, I mean, we're now starting to get a kilometre an hour out, but take a look at that application difference in terms of what the throttle is doing. So that shows you just what a powerful tuning tool the diff is, and it becomes even more stark when you take a look at um, what the um, what you're doing at um, with um, uh, the, uh, uh, with um, the super diff. Take a look at the difference in throttle application, the difference in speeds, and the difference in steering lock. You lost a little bit coming in. Uh, but you lost a little bit coming in because of um, just the way um, the uh, the um, because of the way the um, super diff was doing um, the front steer torque, and you lost a little bit in the mid uh, corner, but not terribly much. But where you really pack it in is is where you really pack it in is power out. So that's something worth keeping in mind. Where the bar results um, made, uh, uh, where the bar results made their presence felt, is you lost a little bit coming in um, due to chassis stability, but it wasn't that much. But again, you get a, uh, you get a gain on terms of what the throttle is doing, and also too in terms of what you're doing in terms of um, power out because you've got um, less load transfer happening at the front. You also had the same picture happening with um, that change in rear roll center, albeit it probably wasn't um, as um, stark. Some real key takeaways are from looking at the simulated data is it pretty much confirms just, uh, just how much you can do with um, the diff. And the thing about um, uh, the diff is if we take a look at uh, that free body diagram, you re the reason the diff really makes its presence felt is if you take a look at just how much load is on the outside front tire, you've got an awful, awful lot of cheddar that you can play with in terms of the available traction circle radius on the outside tire, which is why the diff is a really, really big tuning tool. It's not quite money for nothing, but it's really close. Again, the, the bar changes pretty much and the, and the geometry changes went the way I would expect it. Now, just a point in terms of the magnitude of the simulation changes. For a simulation change, I mean, particularly at a place like Willowbank, a point one of a second change is actually is actually a pretty is a, is actually um, I won't say it's quite uh, nothing to write. It's a, it's not quite um, cause for a national holiday, but it does actually uh, make its presence felt. And just remember, simulate, as I covered in uh, one of my um, earlier Dance Vehicle Dynamics tutorials, just remember, sim changes are always going to be a lot less than your, um, uh, uh, than your actual changes. So um, uh, bear that in mind. So some parting thoughts. Look, I know this might upset a few fanboys here, but front-wheel drive setup, particularly when you're dealing on the edges of the traction circle, really is disaster, ma it really is disaster management. Now, your order of business is diff, Geometry, springs, bars, and toes. Now, you use a static Excel sheet to get you in the ballpark. You refine that using simulation. But just remember, ladies and gentlemen, the final test is always the track. Just remember, these are tools to help you get in the ballpark. But ultimately, it's up to you to use this appropriately and to tune it appropriately. Now, the great thing is that you can also try this out with Chassis Sim. So give that a run. And we'll catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner.